This is Sunday, July 29, 2012. My name is Michelle Hill, and I am interviewing Mr. Marshall, Mr. William Clarence Marshall as part, part of the Case Western Reserve University's School of Justice. Um, and this is part of the Voicing an Action Project. Thank you so much for signing the consent form. Well, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> okay. Um, tell me about your parents. What were their names, um, their date of birth, where were they born, and uh, so on and so forth. My father, William Clarence Marshall, I'm a third, so my father's a second. Um, my father was born in Haynesville, Louisiana. That's uh, April 12th, 1938. My mother, Henrietta Scott, who would later become Henrietta Scott Marshall, was born also in, uh, like myself, Manila, the Republic of the Philippine Islands, August 18th, 1940. And uh, my father was in the service of the United States Navy when he met my mother. And at the time, my mother was all of 16, my father was 18, and they courted for two years. And it's an interesting story because my mother was actually in a bar. And my father came in and he was, I saw what my mother saw, a picture. He was, um, you know, he was a lad, you know, the United States Navy wearing his whites. And he walked in and he was very smooth and he was gorgeously black. And she, the story she tells is she touched his face and he was just so smooth. And he slapped her hand away. And he says, um, I'm, I'm not here to get married. You know, I'm here in the United States Navy. Two years later, my mother had him. Now, interestingly enough, my mother's sister, who is 20 years older than my mother, actually met my father first, but unbeknownst to my aunt, uh, she had no idea that my father had met my mother at all. And they were actually going around. If you can imagine a woman who's 20 years older back in 1956. And the story that my mother and father tell is that my sister, I mean my, my aunt, Wilhelmina, who we used to call men, was uh, very enamored of my father. And they got along famously. But then when my sister met my mother, I mean, met my sister, my, my mother met my father, and she learned this from her sister. She told sis, look, I got this. And her sister actually stepped back. And... Was it because of her age? No, she, she just, I guess, I, I, I guess my, my Aunt Wilhelmina mm -hmm. uh, probably decided in her wisdom that that would probably be a better fit. You know, my, my uh, Aunt Wilhelmina was always, she was always very sage, you know. Uh, she was the oldest. Uh, and I'm told that she was always, she was the brightest. And uh, I, had, I had plenty of opportunity to uh, know my Aunt Wilhelmina. And it would have been really interesting if she had been my mother. You know, seeing as how it's, a, it's kind of the same, uh, it's the same family as it were. And uh, I think about it sometimes, you know, my Aunt Wilhelmina could have been my mother. I, I, and I think about it because I would have still had the same, the same so, sort of look, this African-American, uh, African-American, Egyptian, Seminole, Filipino mix, which is what our, our family is. I would have probably still looked the same because, you know, they're sisters and they look very, very much alike, except my Aunt Wilhelmina was 20 years older than my mother. And if my mother and father ever see this, they're going to go, should be telling that story. <laughs> but I'm telling it. Yes. Anyway, um, my parents were married, of course, in the Philippines. And at that time, men who were in the service of the United States Navy had to get permission up to the age of 25. I mean, my mother was uh, held dual citizenship. So it wasn't like, even though the Philippines is a faraway country, 
and she already had that status because her father, uh, my mother's father, William Marshall Scott, which is a totally different story, and maybe we'll get to that, uh, was also in the service of the United States Army and fought in the Spanish-American War. He's a Buffalo soldier. He was in the uh, 24th, Inf 24th Infantry Company E, and he fought the Spanish-American War, and then he would fight what we would call the Philippine, the, uh, um, some people would call it the Philippine Insurrection, but it wasn't an insurrection. It was a, it was a war between the Philippines and the United States what some people would term the United States' first Vietnam. And my grandfather was involved in that. And of course, he met a Filipino. And his, his name it was Henry William George Marshall Scott. My mother married a man named William Marshall. Mm -hmm. And so their, their, their romance is really actually more interesting than my parents. He was born in 1870. It's my grandfather. Not a great grandfather, but grandfather. I'm born in 58. He died in 52. But my grandmother wasn't born until 1897. So there's 27 years difference. They had seven children. They were both Roman Catholics. And not until my mother was born did he marry her. Mm -hmm. So uh, they lived together in a great big three-story house. They had two cars and a farmhouse in the country, which is a, a, another story of all about my grandfather's life. But this Buffalo soldier comes to the Philippines and marries a, a young Filipino and has seven children. He was, um, he was still in the service of the, the United States Army and then became a teamster. And the way I hear it, my grandfather made his living as a part-time constable and a full-time gambler. He actually became quite wealthy doing so. The house in the country and the house in the capital city and seven children and two cars and this big gigantic three-story house. Um, the Japanese who come to bomb the Philippines. And he used the farmhouse to shuttle relatives from the capital city into the country. And many of our relatives lived in this farmhouse. He eluded the Japanese and one day they caught him. Now, my grandfather was a tough old man. He was 72 years old when the Japanese caught him and had him in a concentration camp, interned in a concentration camp for 18 months until MacArthur liberated the Philippines. And then he was repatriated with the family and died 10 years later. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine a 72-year-old man being in a concentration camp? He survived that. Yeah. That is powerful. Yeah, he was, uh, he was quite, he's quite the man. There is a, I actually have a picture of him upstairs. I mean, if you want to use it, I don't know uh, what you're going to do with your project, but um, I have a picture of him uh, that, you know, that's framed. He's, uh, in the picture, he's 65 years of age. And I, I cropped it out, but there are a number of men around him that were former Buffalo soldiers, African Americans that decided not to return to this country. And one of the reasons they didn't return to this country, besides but besides the racism, is I found out that when you were serving overseas, serving, let's say, 10 years overseas, was like serving 30 years stateside. So there was a great financial benefit for staying overseas. So he stayed overseas. His money went further in the Philippines. So besides being in love, uh, the, uh, the, the financial attainment and feeling like the master of all he surveyed, it was to his advantage to stay, you know, in a, in a way, out of harm's way and provide for his family and feel like a man. So he never, um, he never returned to the United States of America.
he died in the Philippines, and his his body was at my 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 grandmother's death. Both bodies were well. His body was brought to this country um, before my grandmother died, and then when my grandmother died, we had them both interned in uh, San Francisco. All right. uh, my grandmother died in 1988 in San Francisco, California. So his body, his body was brought from the Philippines, and they were both, you know. It's kind of one of those, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the musical South Pacific, Older Man, that there's, there's, their story is very much this Nellie Forbush and Emile de Beck, two different cultures, ages. He already, he had actually had children before her. And uh, their story was rich. And they, uh, my grandmother was very much the, the kind of woman when he, when my grandfather died, it was 1952, so you think she was born in 1897, she's 55. She didn't know another man at all. She, that's all she saw was him. And I know that from time to time we would try to get her interested. She was not about that. She was, uh, she was kind of indignant about it. She's like, that's, that's rude. I had one man and that was the one man for me. So they had a you know a happily ever after kind of story you know they I mean they had they, they had their hardships the war brought hardships because prior to World War II they lived in they lived in the lap of luxury the war came it became very hard you know the Japanese were were of course you know they were the they were the aggressors in that region and then when MacArthur came you know MacArthur is um, he's a real he's like a god. You know, in the Philippines. You know, he liberated Filipinos. He promised that's what he would do, and he did it. And uh, I wouldn't be here, pretty much, if certain things didn't transpire. Anyway, so our African American relationship is is rooted. There's a a relationship that goes back at least a century. Uh, you know, because people have asked me, you know, African Americans, Philippines. Actually, it's quite a natural thing. And uh, anthropologically speaking, um, there are af there there's a there's a rich African history in the Philippines. Um, if you go to the Philippines this very day, the Negritos, the Visayans, and the Igorots are remnants of Africans that crossed the Asian subcontinent and then into the Philippines. And they lived, arguably the Philippines did not have uh, an indigenous population, but they were there and they mixed in with Melanesians, Polynesians, Micronesians and became these people. That you know, we now call Filipinos. You know, when Magellan finally came to the Philippines, he recognized the black people that he would know from North Africa. Negritos. They were these small Africans. What are they doing here? Well, they were here before you. So you didn't discover you didn't discover anything. Okay, they were here. And if you if you uh, if you were ever in our home, you'll notice weaponry that looks just like African weaponry from the Philippines. It's, it's amazing. It's meaning that it's as though they were, their Africanness was undisturbed in the Philippines. And when, you know, folks, explorers came to discover, they're like, wow, how did they get here? They, it, they, 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 nobody bothered them because they didn't know they were there. So, you know, the diaspora, it shouldn't, be a surpri it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that Africans were travelers. They were actually seafarers. Um, and there's, there's plenty of evidence. The Chinese would, uh, with the country that we now call Mauritius, off of the, uh, 
the south. Oh no, is it, is it the, no, no, it is the, there's, there's Madagascar, so it is north and east of Madagascar. Mauritius is a very, very small, small country, and the Chinese frequently, when they came around in their, their big armadas, would trade with Africans long before there was a Marco Polo, long before Marco Polo ever went from Venice to China. They were already trading in, in things of value. And if you go to a place like Mauritius, you'll say, wow, there are these Asians here, there are Chinese. They've been there for a long, long time. Yeah, we don't think of African Americans as, well, well, we don't swim, <laughs> okay? We don't swim, we weren't explorers. That's not true. This has certainly been very enriching in terms of history. It's been a wonderful history lesson. Uh, I want to pull it in and talk about that richness that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Were you aware of that when you were growing up? Or, or, or did you just go back afterwards and delve into your history? No, I was... Um, we come from a family, if you don't already know, we're... we're we're talkers, not necessarily loud talkers or even boisterous, but we talk. And uh, I have discovered that in our family and extended families and related families that there are other people who are interested in genealogy and not scared of, well, who's your mother? Who's your father? Who was your real mother? Who was your real father? Um, they wanted to know. And there were a lot of people that um, had pictures. My grandmother was one to, um, she didn't have albums. She had these, um, she kept everything in shoe boxes. And I'll tell you this story. My, my grandmother, Mary Washington, who was Mary Presley, uh, and On she was, side. Um, uh, she is my, mm, she is my uh, paternal grandmother. And she was born in Arkansas. I don't know if she was born in Little Rock. I know there are folks from Little Rock, but my grandmother was born in 19, oh, come on, William, 1916, and she died in 1995. So she was, no, I mean, not 1995. She was born in 1916 and died in 2011. So she was 95. Um, so, so born when she came to here to the, oh. to the states. Or she well, no, no, she was she was born she was born here. My 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 grandmother. But her parents were from Arkansas. Yeah, they were born from and then of course she she uh, they eventually ended up in Louisiana, and of course she married William Clarence, the first William Clarence. How did they end up there? Do you know? Well, I know William Clarence is always uh, he, he never left Louisiana. Okay, but she. Um, um, I know that there were, there were Presleys already in Louisiana. Um, that part of her story, I don't know. I know when she was married and uh, she put him down. <laughs> she was the only woman I understand that uh, put William Clarence Marshall down. She put him in his place and, and, and divorced him. Um, she was, my grandfather had a penchant for extremely dark women. He was, um, for lack of a better term, he was a lighty brighty. He was very, very light. He looked like, um, he looked sort of like Pancho Villa. Yeah, that's what he looked like. And he chased dark women. So if you were, he was talking to you and then saw a darker sister later for you and uh, consequently all of his children tend to be tend to be chocolate anyway she put after um, after a while she felt disrespected so she moved on she moved on to California grandmother moved on to California and this was after how many years of philandering philandering um, I would say Probably, 
probably four years. And she, she had enough. And uh, she moved to California, Oakland, California. And she basically kept one job. She worked for the Nabisco factory and retired from the Nabisco factory. So now we're talking about the early 40s. And uh, she lived in Oakland and uh, eventually she died in Oakland, Oakland, California. And um, God, I could go on about this. I don't, get to, I don't get to talk like this, but anyway, she was, this whole thing about shoe boxes. I remember going over to her house this one time and I said, hey, Grandma. She had these shoe boxes out. They had full of pictures. And I saw a picture. I said, who's this? And she pulled it out. She said, oh, that's some little man I met. I said, oh, okay. Well, who's this? Oh, that's some little man I met. So this went on for a while, and I pulled out a picture. It's kind of oversized picture, very handsome man. Hey, Grandma, who's this? And she looked at it. She goes, that's some man I met. And that's exactly her voice dropped down. And she looked at it and she put it to the side and she looked at it again. She go, mm. And uh, I understand that my grandmother, you know, after she left my grandfather, divorced him, formally divorced him, she, uh, she had a life. And I saw this marvelous picture of her sitting, sitting at a bar. I guess she was relaxing. She had a cigarette in one hand and a little glass of something in another. She goes, yeah. She goes, I had a, I had a good time, you know. Um, she, was, um, she was religious. Um, what religion? She, my, my grandmother was a Baptist. Yeah, she was a Baptist. And uh, she belonged, I know, same Baptist church. I, I can't even remember because... We didn't, go to a, we didn't go to a Baptist church. We would spend many, many summers with her, two months out of the year. My father would bring us up and we would, he'd leave and we were uh, under my grandmother's care, but one time she wanted to um, take us to a Baptist church. And I told her, you'd have to ask my father for permission. And she thought this was outrageous. And she had to call, my, she had to call her son. And he said, uh, Mom, that, that's right. You know, I'm raising him in another religion. So she got the permission. So, you know, he started going to this one church with her. But I discovered that my grandmother had an amazing voice, an amazing voice. She would listen to the radio. And I remember it was the Jackson Funeral Home. And, of course, they sponsored a, a gospel on the radio. And I'd wake up and I'd hear the Jackson Funeral Home. But I never saw her, not one time not shimmy, not hum, not anything. She didn't hum. So I just assumed she didn't have anything for singing. Well, one day, uh, this was before she had to get permission, you know, to take us to her church. My brother and I, we, we tracked her. So we find out what she's gonna do. Well, she got up in this church and she took off her little shoes. It was her turn to sing. And she was in the back, but she wasn't singing with the choir. And she got up, and she walked to the front, and she put her head back. She kind of slumped her shoulder, and out came a sound, and it just kept coming and coming and coming. And it was glorious, and it was clear as a bell. And then she stopped, and she walked back to her seat, put on her little grandma's shoes as though nothing had happened. And she would do this Sunday after Sunday, but she never sang in front of us. She never even hummed. I had no idea she could, she even had the gift of song, but she had it. It was an amazingly clear and beautiful, not piercing, but it was powerful and it was clear. And the church was silent. So I, my so-called ability to sing comes from both sides. Yeah. Was that what piqued your interest in music at that time? No, actually, no. It, it, came, it came, I was 
junior high school. I was telling you about a place called Benner Junior High School yes. in um, Mountain View. No, that was Sunnyvale, California by the time I'm in, in junior high. And we were at that time, this is the 1970s now, early 1970s, late, yeah, the very early, the end of the 60s, right, 71, 72. And I met a teacher. Her name was Denise Kilborn. And Denise Kilborn was a drama teacher, performing arts teacher. And we were allowed to take electives. You know. So I thought, oh, I'll take this class near the end of the day. It sounds like fun. We got into the class, and Miss Kilborn said she needed to assess our abilities. So she said, whatever you do, draw, sing, dance, I need to see it. And I thought about her and I said, oh, I don't know. So I sang for her. I said, okay, I'll, I'll sing something. I said, no, I can't dance. Uh, I can draw, I can paint, I can even whistle. But I said, okay, I'll, I'll sing for you. So I sang for her. And um, my recollection is she at the end of the class, she says, I want you to stay. I want me to stay. I don't know what I do. So she took me across a dirt field, and I met a, name, a man by the name of William Graham, who would later become a, a classical DJ in New York many years later. But he was the choral teacher. And I still, even when I got in, I, I didn't take choir there at all. And I didn't do choir in church. And uh, she said, I want you to do the same thing you just did for me, for Mr. Graham. So I was a little short kid back then. I sat in this swivel chair, and my legs didn't touch the ground, not even close. And I sang for him. And uh, he had the same sort of look on his face. I said, is, this, is there something wrong? He says, who sent you here? I said, oh. Taking a class. Something wrong? He says, Do you know that you can sing? I said, Everybody can sing. It's a big deal. He says, No, no, no. He says, You 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 have a gift. You you can sing. I said, Well, okay. You breathe and you open your mouth and you let the air out and you sing. So I didn't get that. So I was in my first musical, it's called Once Upon a Mattress. And then after Once Upon a Mattress, it was a musical called Escape. And then uh, I got this bug, acting bug, performing arts bug. But I wasn't interested in music as a career. I still wanted to be an astronaut. So I kept up with, kept up with both. How old were you when this? I was 11. It was 11, it was the first time I ever sang. It was the first time I'd ever sung in public. You know, besides church, my father and I, we'd bellow, you know. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true. You know, my father and I, we would sing together. Did he have a similar voice? Yeah, he has a, it's, it's, everyone in our family is, got a low voice. Even the women have low voices. And when I say low, they're, um, they have a mature sound. They're not, they're not sopranos. You know, they're altos. Um, they've got rich, velvety, dark voices. The men are not tenors. They're either baritones and they're basses. And the women, uh, at best, they are altos. Uh, I guess we just, that's the way they come out. You know, the factory just says, Choo -choo, you're going to be an alto and you are going to be a bass. No tenors, no sopranos. So <clears throat> my father sang. My father sang uh, in choir. Uh, all 12 of his years in a, uh, a school, a Catholic school for coloreds, yeah, in Louisiana. He was in choir all those years, and his, his boy soprano broke at about the age of 17, and then his voice fell into, fell into darkness. He's got a, it's, it's deep. He's got one of those, uh, hey boy, you know, he's got one of those kind of voices. It's got a little... It's got a little southerness to it. It's, uh, 
but it's 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 a dark voice. It's one of those kind of voices that when you when you hear him calling, you know, you need to you need to show up. What you doing behind the, you know, what you doing behind those rocks there? You know, it's kind of like Moses talking to you. He's it's it's it, it's a gentle voice, but it's still, hey boy, you hear me? You know that kind of thing. Anyway, he um, he sang, but my father didn't stop me from my interest in music. Um, and he didn't stop me for my interest in aeronautics. Thank you. Today is Sunday, August the 12th, 2012, and we are we are completing the interview with Mr. William Clarence Marshall the 3rd. 3rd it is. And um, We're going to pick up with some, um, w try to pick up where we left off. And um, I do believe you were talking about um, education, your music education, how you ended up in mm -hmm. the music area. Yes, I wanted to be an astronaut. That's right. So, let's see. All through elementary school, and middle school, junior high, and high school, I wanted to be an astronaut. That's all I thought about. I would draw ships. I would imagine that I was a spaceman. I'd build, you know, little box configurations of a rocket. My father took me to space camp. We, because my father was in the military, there was a NASA Ames Research Center. And when they started experimenting with the space shuttle, they had a gigantic wind tunnel. Actually, it's the largest wind tunnel in North America. And you could take tours of it. And of course, they had, uh, all kinds of amazing things to test astronauts and, of course, spacecraft. And, of course, you know, we were there all the time because we lived on the base. Anyway, we fast forward. I'm in high school. And actually not high school. My, um, my venture into music started when I was 11 years old. And it was the last class of the day. It was a performing arts elective. And my teacher's name was Denise Kilborn. She was a performing arts teacher. And when we started in the class, she asked us all that we would have to show some kind of talent, whatever that was. You could juggle, tell jokes, stories, sing, whatever. So <clears throat> I had to think about that because I didn't do any of those things. I didn't dance. You know, I didn't juggle. I tell stories. Um, I said I'd sing. So. I sang the national anthem for her, and after the class, she asked me to stay. She singled me out, and I thought, you know, what did I do? She took me across a dirt field to a choral teacher by the name of William Graham. And um, I recall it was very dusty, and we walked into a quad kind of building, and she sat me down, and at that time, I was still not very tall, and sat me in one of these swivel chairs and my legs were dangling. And she said, I want you to do exactly what you did for me. I want you to sing the same song for Mr. Graham. So I complied and I did so. And he had the same, the same reaction. He thought it was remarkable. So he asked me several questions. Do you sing? So well, everyone sings, quite naturally. He says, uh, do you sing in a choir? I said, no. Do you sing in church? I said, other than to go to the local Catholic church and sing with my father, I said, no. I said, my father sings. I said, we have a long history of people who sing and actually sing quite well. So um, they took a few minutes scratching their heads and um, remarked that you know you have a gift okay a gift I figured that teachers would all teachers said that kind of thing because all they want you to do is participate they'll tell you anything as long as you'll participate and um, that's still even to this day that's still my that's still my theory about teachers they'll tell you anything they want their students to participate so I sang that national anthem, and I was in her class. And 
for lack of a better word, she doted on me in particular. Um, my first musical was Once Upon a Mattress. And then I did another show called Escape. Miss Kilborn didn't have any children at all. She had been married, but she didn't have children. And she would take me around the San Francisco Bay Area. I was like her pet. She would take me to the museum. She would take me to the opera. Took me to the ballet. She would take me to audition for shows that had absolutely nothing to do with the school. In her mind, she thought that my talent or my gift was outsized. So she made sure that this was the road that I was going to take. Unbeknownst to me, I had no idea. I thought it was fun. I liked doing it. I liked going places. I liked going places with Mrs. Kilborn. My mother was concerned with Mrs. Kilborn because she thought it was an odd, a little odd. My father said he'd keep a watch out. And he told me that if Miss Kilborn needs her trash taken out or the any chores around the house, do it. Okay. It's not every day that someone would take that kind of interest in their students outside of school. So my father was um, my father would check in, come by, you know, to see that, you know, everything was above board. And after a while he he felt that, you know, everything was above board. So Miss Skillborn would take me into San Francisco and I would, like I said, regular this is a regular occurrence. We're talking, you know, three, four times a week. You know, I would go with Miss Kilborn wherever. I go to auditions, I go to shows, and rather rather adult shows, you know. I, I remember seeing a show called Seventy Girls Seventy. Um, um, I saw plenty of Shakespeare at, at Berkeley Rep. Um, like I said, regularly at the ballet, the opera, and the like, the symphony, all of that. So, junior high is over, into high school. And Mrs. Kilborn made sure that anyone in the performing arts, people like uh, Mr. Riggle, who was the band leader, Shereen Clark, the drama teacher, and uh, William Gladstone Stretch, which was my choral teacher, would know about me. Um, and she would check in on me, even though I was already in high school. And beyond high school, she would still check in on me. So <clears throat> I got into my typical day in high school was, first period was a cappella choir, second period was choraliers. My last period of the day was a barbershop quartet, and after school was drama. And I participated in all of the plays in high school. And of course, my first and second period was always a cappella choir and the smaller choir, choraliers. And then some band practice. So, and then of course, all of the other courses, you know, be they math, science, you know, English, all of that. And uh, of course that went on for the four years, but my mind was still into, my mind was still into being an astronaut. So I was introduced to a gentleman by the name of Michael Morse. He's a baritone, very fine baritone, became my um, very first voice teacher. I started taking voice lessons at 17 years old. And Michael, had deduced that my voice would do its best work singing opera. So I didn't have a problem with that because I like opera, but that's a different story, maybe for another time. So I started taking lessons with Michael Morris. And in a short while, Michael had said that, I really can't teach you. I have a, my teacher. My teacher can, I think, will serve you better. His teacher's at the College of Notre Dame. And in that, uh, he was able to get me a vocal scholarship. I mean, I wasn't attending the College of Notre Dame. College of Notre Dame is in Belmont, California. It's, uh, it's uh, kind of halfway between uh, Palo Alto, California, and San Francisco. Anyway, so I started taking lessons there. And uh, one of the days I was taking lessons, I bumped into Shirley, Shirley Temple Black. She was on the board, and I was like, wow, Shirley Temple. She looks, she looked the same. She looked like Shirley Temple. So, uh, you know, spoke to her for a minute and said, I've got to run. And um, started taking voice lessons with Michael Morse's teacher. I'm trying to remember 
that teacher's name, it's kind of escaping my R. I'm going across the field after I met Shirley Temple Black, you know, and I'm taking my first voice lesson. Well, weeks go by, and Michael Morris's teacher, I cannot remember that teacher amazingly enough, uh, she says to me that I, too, think I have a better teacher for you, somebody that can serve you better. So she tells me about an instructor, voice professor named, hold on, a voice professor by the name of Gene Garson. Now, incidentally, I have a friend. Um, his name is Kirk Van Cleve. Kirk Van Cleve is this really, really tall, tall, exceedingly tall man. He's very, very skinny, frightfully skinny, like his oboe. He played oboe. And he was a great oboe player. And he sang also. Um, he was a, he was a, he had perfect pitch, but that didn't help his singing. His singing was true and it was accurate, but it wasn't a wonderful singing voice. But he played oboe exceedingly well. And so he said, so you're gonna think about coming to state? I said, I had already um, applied for the School of Aeronautics. Because San Jose State has a wonderful school of aeronautics, teaching, business, and music, incidentally. So, so I'm thinking, you know, I'm just waiting to see what the whole application process is going to be. And Kirk suggests that, hey, you know, we got this uh, vocal studio that's happening before school. And uh, I can introduce you to Miss Garson. So I'm introduced to Miss Garson, and Miss Garson um, looks like a voice teacher. And, and what I mean by that is she looks like someone that you'd put a um, helmet on, a Viking helmet, right? And the armor, you know. You know, she's well endowed, and, you know, she, she's got that kind of voice. And um, she had this wonderful artistic sensibility. She could play piano like a professional accompanist, and she was extremely lingual, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Russian. And, you know, she had all these students, you know, they were all upperclassmen, and I'm just coming in and I'm watching. And near the end of the class, she suggests that I sing. And I thought, absolutely not. I'm not going to sing. I had just heard these people. They're very polished. I said, I can't do that for you. I said, I, besides, I didn't bring any material. She goes, well, I've got all kinds of material. And all the way around her studio, it's just full, chock full of scores. Anything that you want to sing. And she wasn't getting it. I don't want to sing. You're putting me in a, you know, an uncomfortable position. And she goes, I, don't, I really, I don't care what it is. So I said, okay, I'll do that. I thought of two numbers. There's a number from the Magic Flute that I still sing called Oesis und Osiris. And it's from a Mozart opera, Magic Flute. And the other was Old Man River. And I, at that time, there was a wonderful um, accompanist. His name was Brendan Hassman. And uh, Brendan played for her studio for a number of years. Now, Brendan was this... Uh, I think I remember Brendan was from Texas, and he had this interesting sensibility. He would wear his hair um, parted in the middle. Sometimes he'd streak it with little, you know, artificial coloring. But he'd always wear a tuxedo to all of his recitals. But he'd wear Converse, the Converse high tops. But he would wear, you know, one yellow color and one green color, right? and wear a perfectly black, you know, tuxedo with tails, everything, you know. But he would, it was all about, all about the converse. And he played. He played exceedingly well. He played for all of us. So I was, I was asking him, I said, hey, look, I'm about to sing Old Man River, and what I need is, I need you to, it starts with a recit, okay, a recitative. I said, like an opera. And I said, when we get to the, main part of the song. I really want you to roll these chords and I really want you to follow me. I don't want it to be just what's on the page. And he says, I got you. And all of a sudden he starts and it's just, it's a beautiful tempo. He sets it up very nicely. And it was easy to sing. So, you know, I started. There's an old man called the Mississippi. 
that's the old man that I likes to be. And then he just starts to roll those beautiful chords. Old man river. And so I was like, this is the guy, you know, he can do it. And he could play anything. I mean, Brendan was, Brendan was, he was consummate. He could, he could play, you know, like, like Jimmy, like Jimi Hendrix. You know, he could cross his hands, right or left, and still imagine this is the right hand, this is the left hand. But he'd play the left hand, look at the score, and play the right hand here, and just do it with this unbelievable facility. He was, his mind and his soul and his body were ambidextrous. Just, he was amazing. Just amazing tricks. I don't know where Brendan is now, but he was, he was fabulous. Brendan, if you're still somewhere in the world, you're wonderful. Anyway, so we move on to my singing. And Miss Garson asks me to stay. And for the next 25 minutes, I don't know what she's doing. She's in another room. She's making these phone calls. She comes out and she makes this pronouncement that I'm going to be her student. I said, I, haven't, I don't have an acceptance from the university. And she says, oh, yes, you do. She says so. And I actually was kind of taken aback by that. I said, I'm here for aeronautics. I want to be an astronaut. That's what I want to do. And, you know, her retort was, why? Why would you want to be an astronaut? I said, because that's what I want to do. That's where I want to go. That's all I've been thinking about. That's what I've been studying. And then made absolutely no never mind to her. She just, you're going to be my student. I've already called admissions, and I've already called one of the regents, and I've already okayed it with the dean. You know, it was basically, you ought to hear this person. And on her say-so, the strength of her say-so, and I guess her years of experience mm -hmm. convinced them. She says, you're going to come here and I'm going to teach you. And I said, absolutely not. I didn't take to that. I, I actually was not impressed. And she said, okay, look, I'll tell you what, we'll go one year, one year of vocal studies. And after, after a year, I can guarantee you that you can get a full ride in aeronautics. Now, that stopped me. I thought, hmm. And I asked her if I could get it in writing. And then I started taking the lessons. Come faithfully, well, more times than not. Uh, Mondays, 9 o'clock. And more times than not, it would go 9 to 10 and then from 10 to 11 because often the other student didn't come. So I'd get another hour. So this went on. Years coming up and I'm thinking, wow, I like this. And like taking, I, I, I really, really enjoy this. But I'm, my mind is still in aeronautics. And I was trying to find a way to do them both. You know, the so-called double major. And I found that that would... So, Gene Garson gives this wonderful offer and says, study with me for a year, and I can guarantee you that if you don't like music, I'll make sure that the university gives you a full ride in aeronautics. I thought, wow. So I'm taking voice lessons with her, you know, three times a week, uh, generally Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And I mean, I really like it. I like Miss Garson. I, I like music, always did but I'm still thinking about aeronautics. And we're getting close to that year, wanting to make that decision. And my decision was still about aeronautics. And I was trying to find a way, can I do aeronautics and can I do music? And I found that that wasn't possible. And also I wasn't patient enough to say, I don't want to be here that many years. I want to get in and out. So I found that it, too much coursework here, too much coursework there. It's not, it's not going to happen. Um, you know, I'd be there all day and all night. So I made the decision for music, and that still bothered me. That still bothered me. I thought, wow, all of this is gone in a snap because I met 
here's a confluence, here's another confluence, and all of a sudden, those dreams, all that wondering, all that, it's just going to be gone. It bothered me for a long, long time. So I'm still... Do you think it's possible for uh, a young child growing up in East Cleveland today to have uh, the opportunity? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, it is. Right. Uh, and and there, for me, that, that it's a good question. On the face of it, anyone else would say no. And what it really is about, and this is going to sound, this will sound corny, but it's about a teacher who recognizes recognizes something in a child, whether it's a fire, a curiosity, and the two meet, and they ignite, and they literally work off of each other. The teacher is also being taught. It isn't always about, I'm imparting knowledge to you. Some teachers all of a sudden are filled with just that. The gift that they are attempting to impart, all of a sudden become, it becomes easier. It isn't a drag on them um, because they've got this, somebody who wants to learn, somebody that wants to be filled up, as it were. Um, and it, it's, it's not to say that uh, uh, there isn't, a, there isn't a nuts and bolts or a science to teaching, but it can be done here. I mean, look at the Olympics. You know, Gabby, for instance. I mean, look at her story. And here she is. You know, she's the darling of the world now. I mean, this is, this is real work. And in, in, in an unusual set of circumstances, Ma, I got to go do this. Okay? And she's doing it. And she's done it. And she is, she is the other children can see that and say, I can do that. It can be done. It can be done right here. East Cleveland, um, we need to get out of the idea that we're in a rut, okay? We need to get in the idea that we're on the road and wherever it is that we want to go, we can go. I tell, I tell children when I have the opportunity to be in front of them, I said, you, so I'm, what I mean to say is I'm referencing Gabby Douglas, okay? Sensational, a great story. Tells Ma, look, I need to go. I really need to do this. This, this young lady has real fire in the belly. And you're referring to Gabby Douglas, who was on the gymnastics yes, team exactly. in the 2012 Summer Olympics mm -hmm. that took place in London. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, that's a remarkable and, and, and I mean, really a unique story. And bringing it back to East Cleveland, we have to stop thinking of ourselves in a rut. I tell children when I have the opportunity, students, that the first thing I often say is, you are the masters of all you survey. You come from great people. You don't have to think that what I'm doing is a first. It's already laid out for you, okay? These are the builders of pyramids, great civilizations and sciences. Okay, it's already there. All you need to do is own it. It's there. It isn't a first. All you're doing is reconnecting with what you are. Okay, regardless of the obstacle. Okay. Do you see any institutions within the East Cleveland area that would enable children to do that more readily? Let's see. The stuff that's happening like at Windermere, you know, uh, like with my neighbor, Pat Lahoviak, you know, the gardening that's starting to happen, uh, the, the folks at uh, Neighborhood Connections. Um, Shaw, for instance, is really into their music program. And I start to see that evolving in a, in a, in a different way. Um, I'd like to I'd like to see more art in the curriculum um, because I, I I don't believe that taking art out is it's a it's a danger um, anytime you start telling telling people that there isn't room for creativity 
our society stalls. Everyone cannot be the same. Okay? We can't all be doctors and we can't all be lawyers. Okay? And if we don't have that choice, our children will stall. And if we don't set a bar that says when it comes to money, the appraise, a simple, a simple resource like praising, praising you and lifting you up and saying, yes, you can, and yes, you will, and you will, because I will be there, come, come hell or high water, I'm going to be there. You know, your family and your extended family and this city and this, everything that goes with it, we will be there to help you. We will be cushioned, we will be support, we will we'll be there at the finish line. And that's what needs to happen. And I, I mean, there are all kinds of resources right, right in East Cleveland and adjacent East Cleveland. That's the reason I'm here. The, the, the reason I, I, I came here. In 1992, I started doing uh, Broadway national tours and um, international tours. Cleveland is often the first stop uh, on uh, Broadway national tours. And the reason is because uh, they, the powers that be in Cleveland reinvested in their stage and statecraft, meaning the folks down at the Idea Center and uh, Cleveland Playhouse and Playhouse Square. You know, years ago, they were going to turn it into a parking lot. Some good folks said, you know, that can't happen. So it is the second largest theater district in the United States outside of New York. So naturally, we had the benefit because someone said years ago, you can't have this happen. So everyone can enjoy. And, and it goes back to my point. If, you're, if you take the arts out, well, something's going to stall. The creativity will stall. And guess what? The economics will also stall. Okay? You're bringing in more than a billion dollars into this region because of the arts. Anyway, beyond all that, coming to East Cleveland, I started to associate my self with people the early 90s. So how did you actually make that, that move? Where were you at the time before you came to no. East Cleveland? I was in New York City. I had been living in New York for 20 plus years. And, you know, coming here in the 90s, even Cleveland proper was different than it is now. And I thought, hmm, but the people were fabulous. I mean, the greatest resource of this region is not because it's the Rust Belt. It's the people. And, of course, the people came here for obvious reasons. There is a, there's a melting pot of people and creativity. You can see it. Um, I mean, you've got this large, large expanse, expanses of water. You know, another reason why, okay? So you need to retool, you know, industries. You need to also retool thought. Okay, you got to get out of the idea that, okay, we're going to redo these industries. No, 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 no. New industries. You got to retool your mind. So I saw that coming as an outsider, and I think many outsiders did, because the typical thing is Cle Clevelanders will say, well, why don't you move from, you know, New York to Cleveland? I said, let me ask you something. Why didn't you move to New York? Okay. So now, now they're hearing me. I said, this is a fabulous place. You've got amazing housing stock. That's the reason I'm in this house. Amazing housing stock. You're here, right here, this entire area. The Rockefeller Estate, okay? My house, built in 1915. These are gorgeous houses. And if you ever come into East Cleveland, you will see that. You've got a park, 400 and, well, no, 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 it's 230 and some odd acres. And Rockefeller was here. I mean, this place was rocking. You know, if you want to, you know, for lack of a better word, you've got 3.2 square miles, but 171 streets. And what that tells you is that there was a lot going on. 171 streets on only 3.2 square miles of land. That doesn't, that doesn't make you wonder. There's a lot of business here. So a lot was going on. You have to retool. So I even retooled my own mind and said, yeah, I'm going to come here. I started seeing things. The orchestra is here. I wanted to 
I wanted to participate with the orchestra. I wanted to participate with Opera Cleveland and all of the other institutions, and I made that happen. Literally, with the exception of Cleveland Playhouse itself, I had played in all the houses and played in all the important venues around here. Were you aware of the social economic um, level of East Cleveland mm -hmm. at the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I, I was aware. I said, you know what? Diamond in the rough. Years ago, my father moved to Fremont, California, and he said to my mother, you know, we could go to the church on the hill, you know, fancy, high city church, all that. But they chose a church down the road, and my father got in really, really involved in that particular church. Uh, he remembers the diocese saying, well, you know, you owe us this much. And my father was like, now how does that happen? A little poor church? How are you going to assess a church like this? So my father got together with a bunch of other men. So what are, what are our various talents? Literally. And they sat down. And they rebuilt a school. Total school. They rebuilt it from the ground up. They also took it upon themselves to hire their own teachers. They built a school. And they redid the church. Because they took all of the men in the community and found that they had various talents and said, let's do this, and they did it. So... That's a success story yeah. in and of itself. In it, yes, in and of itself. Yeah. So I thought about what my father had done and said, I said, you know, I could live somewhere else, and it could be really, really easy, but I said, there's something here, because there was something, there was something here, and it's still here, okay? The heart of what East Cleveland was has not left. It just needs to be picked up, okay? And you need to look at it and say, okay, guys like Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie and Jeff the Way did it. We can do it. And we can, we just need to retool. We need to retool our minds. We need to take our commitment and assess what is still here. And then we need to bring others to the table. We need the serious partnerships, and we, meaning East Cleveland, is in the perfect place. Transportation hub, you've got this wonderful, all of University Circle. You've got all the museums, all the artistic institutions, the medical institutions, and the academic institutions. Our children should always be going there, back and forth. I mean, look, it's a third of a mile. It can't get better than that. The bus is right here. The rail is right here. Everything that we need is right here, and we've got this amazing housing stock. We just need a, a little bit of a recommitment instead of saying, you know something, socioeconomics and what? So do it. Hey, look, if you only got a piece of bread today, and it's only peanut butter and it's jelly, well, then that's what you've got. You've got peanut butter and jelly, OK? Tomorrow, it doesn't have to be about peanut butter and jelly. It can, it, it, it can move. You've got you, you to gotta move with it. Anyway, what do you want to say? You want to say something? I'm sorry. Well, what are your fondest memories of East Cleveland since you've been here? Fondest memories of East Cleveland. Let me think. Fondest memories. I, I, one of them that comes to mind is actually seeing the East Cleveland Council. Even though they were having a hard time, at that point saying, you know what, we're going to commit $10,000 to the Shaw High School band so that that band can get to China. That they actually made the commitment. Uh, and and, and they, they, there definitely was dialogue. But they said, we're going to do this. And we're going to see them off. And we're going to welcome them back. And that the school board here actually took the, what was it, more than $700,000 thanks to people like, you know, Connie Schultz putting it in the paper and then it, it goes literally viral. And all of these, okay, uh, folks like Connie Schultz putting in the PD and of course the syndication thereof, the people around the country say, yeah, you know, I'm going to chip in. You know, these, they're going to represent us and they're going to go to China. Let's make that happen. Well, all of the, that money since then has been set aside so that not only the band, but the schools, the six schools here, K-12, 
can feed off that resource. They can buy instruments, they can get music instruction. It's not stalled. Creativity is not stalled. And that's creativity not just in the arts. That's an academic creativity, okay? An institutional creativity. How can we get to where we want to go and where we want to stay and keep that creativity, no matter the discipline, going, moving forward? Okay? I, in and, terms of some of the uh, organizations that you're, you're affiliated with, would you like to please elaborate on those and uh, are any of them related to your relationship with these prisons? Well, in a manner of speaking, I was, um, you know, earlier I was telling you about the Carl Stokes Brigade. Okay. The Carl Stokes Brigade has been around 16 years, and we just started doing some social justice forums. And the social justice, oh, well, the, the Carl Stokes Brigade uh, is named in honor of Carl Burton Stokes, who, of course, was the first African -Amer American mayor in Cleveland, um, or for that matter, a major American city. Uh, city and on his passing uh, he had suggested to Talbert Jennings who's the founder of the Carl Stokes Brigade that you keep that grassroots that spirit alive so he took it seriously and started he formed that group and we meet every every second Saturday at the MLK library faithfully we started this um, social justice forum at the MLK Library, and everyone's invited. It's always in the paper. And um, are there any other East Cleveland residents? Uh, yeah, there are actually other East Cleveland residents involved. Um, Genevieve Mitchell, she's involved, um, and she has she has been the she's been the president, I think once, twice, three times. She's now the interim treasurer. Um, And of course she was, she was a former East Cleveland resident, left and came back because she too believes in East Cleveland. And she, uh, because she was um, a, a Clevelander, a lifelong Clevelander, she's always enjoyed East Cleveland. And you know, I mean, she knows far more about it than I do. She was here during its so-called, you know, glory days. And she's, she's returned to work. So you heard about the glory days of East Cleveland. Um, what stands out in your mind in terms of what you heard? What stands out in my mind, um, the library stands out in my mind because what I, I find fascinating about that is the, the monies that Andrew Carnegie and Rockefeller put aside still help the library to this very day. That's amazing. We have the park. We have this unbelievable resource that is underutilized. More things need to happen in the park. Uh, more family events. We need, to, we need a film festival. We need a carnival. Okay. We need to restore the boathouse. There need to be boats out there. Um, we need to populate the park. It needs to be opened. Um, we need a, a team that's willing to do some conservation. And at the same time, uh, we the citizens need to get in there and clean it up from time to time. Just, you know, hey, it's our park. It was donated. It didn't get better than that. We didn't have to buy it. It was donated. I mean, that's fabulous. I mean, we don't have to go somewhere else. We've got our own central park right here in our own municipality. I mean, you know, that's the envy. There, there are municipalities around here that don't have that kind of land. You know, you, you got to know. That's, that's amazing. I mean, if it was left to me, there would be a, a carousel and a Ferris wheel in the park. You know, I'd, I'd find a way to do it. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd want other people to know. In fact, I think that the city needs to do its own PR as it I think the city needs to do its own PR relative to what are our strengths and make a uh, short video that says, here we are in East Cleveland, at an East Cleveland home, at an East Cleveland event, definitely in the library, and definitely in the library's gem of a theater.
beautiful gem of a theater. Take them out to, take them around the houses, take a housing tour, and then show them the park. Show them events in the park. Show them that we are next to a transportation hub and that we are definitely next to, this is our neighbor in University Circle. Come to East Cleveland, invest in East Cleveland, live here, bring your children here, bring your friends here, okay? William Marshall's here, okay? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, You know, what I've heard about this place is always, it always translates into East Cleveland with the Gold Coast. You know, you had celebrities here and all kinds of artistic people. It was the, like the rest of the, the rest of the region. Like uh, what it, celebrities did you hear? Let's, let's, let, 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 let's see. Um, m most of the celebrities were um, uh, people that were musicians. They were, they were, they were jazzers, uh, as, as it were. You know, Bob Hope used to live here, but then you know that's that's an that's an age ago. Mm -hmm. um, there were just all kinds of artistic types that lived here, uh, that chose to live here. Um, and as time times change, and when I say times, um, the influx of people, in this case, African Americans. You know, when I have conversations with people that have been living here for years in East Cleveland particularly, you know, what I come away with in the conversations is this was the Gold Coast. And there were all kinds of artistic people. I mean, there were all kinds of people of letters, uh, people in music, people in the arts in general, photographers, dancers, choreographers, directors, painters, um, uh, singers. It... It's disheartening to, uh, it, it change is inevitable, but the kind of change I'm talking about that a population different from the population that was once here, African Americans are starting to move in and people fear, um, people fear that, that, that they don't understand. And I, I say this and I say it often, bigotry costs. It costs us, it costs America. And we can't afford that. We can't afford that in this time or any other time. It was and is what it is, but not any longer. We need to understand that it costs in more ways than we can imagine. Many more ways than we can imagine. And we see the deterioration of people and cultures. Whatever was built here, you didn't have to leave. You could have shared in it and made East Cleveland even more instead of, I, I've got to leave. Anyway. What do you think we would have needed in order for that to occur, in order for the, the flight not to happen as okay. fast, or since it has happened? Right, right, right. It, it, it's... It's twofold because there's something else that I, I want to talk about beyond this. The will of people, they don't understand something. They're, they, they often have the will, but they don't have the courage. You need courage. You know, your neighbor says, well, I'm leaving because these people are coming in. You need to turn around and say, why? Why? Why don't we just stay here? Why do we have to fear them? What is there actually to fear? So you need courage and you need will, but what's getting in the way of all of that is ego. Ego. And that's the problem now in East Cleveland, the way I see it. We have, we have leadership. And we have leaders. We have a lot of leaders. We've got community leaders. We have activists. We have teachers, academicians, uh, in, in a number of professions. But when it comes to the leadership that is governance, we definitely have a problem. There is will there. There isn't enough courage. But what's really happening is the ego is supplanting courage and the will. It's not to go to a council meeting and to watch people say that this is a new day and to watch it week after week 
literally dissolve and come into bickering because one fears that I'm not getting credit. What's amazing is that everyone who's in leadership is living in East Cleveland, born in East Cleveland, lived, born, educated, and most likely will expire in East Cleveland. So what exactly is that problem? Ego, ego. You've got will, you need your courage to say, hey, look, let's get rid of our egos. We're, we're, only, we're only what? Maybe 20, 20 and some odd thousand people on 3.2 square miles of land, what exactly is the problem? We've got willing partners around us, you know, and, and many of them are waiting for us, saying, well, what do you want to do? Well, given that it's ego it is a huge problem, what do you think is going to take to break through that? What would you tell the leadership, how, this may be a how question, how can you put aside the egos and start to move forward or help the city move forward? I think our leaders need a retreat, a real retreat. I had a, um, another friend in leadership and they said in order to uh, become a leader, they, they actually worked with other leaders and actually over, uh, this is, this is kind of long because it was a leadership class, over, um, over like a six month period, they had to commit to Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays to come to this retreat. And then they'd go back to, you know, obviously doing their, their, uh, doing their governance, you know, for the people. But they had to commit hours on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and they had to peel back layers of themselves in front of unknown leaders, and they were challenged. They were at literally stripped down like a boot camp, and they were put together by people who thought that they need a, a, literally a, a boost up as it were, and they were recommended by other leaders to this leadership training. And uh, I understand through, through this friend that uh, uh, people were embattled, they'd cry, they uh, began to recognize things in them, uh, faults and strengths that they could meld together and make themselves better leaders. And I think that needs, needs to happen here. Um, yeah, we, we, we do, and they need to come back and then say, okay, we've got to face each other now, okay, because we're basically going to be here, this lot of leaders is going to be here for four years, because it is not about us. And if it continues, then the people need to say that basically bye-bye. And, of course, the problem is, is recognizing new leaders in East Cleveland and getting them to the point that you too can be a leader. And, uh, and I mean a leader in governance, not just, not a social activist, okay, but a, a leader who wants to be mayor or council person or council person at large, because our present leaders aren't going to be here forever. And we need to start recognizing who are our new leaders, who are the leaders that are going to be 20 years old or 30 years old. You know, who do we recognize as a female leader and put a female mayor in place, okay? And maybe it's time. Um, but the people need to tell their leaders that your ego is getting in the way. And we can't afford your ego because you're stalling progress, okay? We should enjoy. It, it shouldn't be that difficult to lead in East Cleveland. It's not 95 square miles like Cleveland. It's 3.2 square miles. It's very small. It should be easy to govern. And because we are in the middle of so many attractive resources and people who are willing to help, 
I'm not saying that our leaders aren't doing that. What I'm saying is that our leaders, what, I, what I'm saying about leadership in East Cleveland is this. It's not that they're not leading. It's not that they're not doing things. Yes, they are. I see that. But they're getting in the way of each other. They're not, they're not, they're not friends. They're not even colleagues. They're constantly embattled and embroiled in and of themselves. And that's not why they should be here. You can see the pained looks on their faces. They're not enjoying it. And they're distrustful. They're, in, and at times, downright disrespectful to each other. And that needs to stop. And if it doesn't stop, you need to get out of the way so that someone else might want to take that mantle. There are people who are here, I can assure you, that would be willing to take that mantle but don't want to play that political game. They just want to get the work done. You have uh, shared a lot about the leadership, your views on leadership, mm -hmm. how, what gets in the way and the things that are needed to move us forward. Mm -hmm. Start. Okay, now. We got through the leadership. You, okay. Mm -hmm. Back to the leadership, we, you, you certainly addressed that issue. Mm -hmm. You said some things that you feel the, need, the leadership needs to know, what they need to do, and you were very specific about it. So now I want to ask you, in what ways do you feel that race slash racism has impacted you personally, and how has it impacted the city of East Cleveland? Um, personally, um, personally, I have a father that, um, uh, I believe that my father is a, a fearless man, fearless. I think I told you before that my father, when he was 15 years old, he saw a man lynched. He actually saw, 1953, he actually saw him lynched. And he talked about it when I was, once when I was quite young, and then once when I could really, really understand. He didn't really, really go into it, but he said it was, he never wants to see anything like that again. Um, and I get the idea from him that bigotry cost, that cost. Um, it cost lives, it cost memories, and it costs potential on both sides of the agenda. Be you white or be you black, uh, when it comes to, well, when it comes to me, um, I probably experienced more racism, actually, having lived in, living in the San Francisco Bay Area. At times, we're, 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 we're on the, hold on. You know, my days uh, in California, specifically the San Francisco Bay Area, I remember um, maybe mid 70s to the mid 80s, you know, living there and, you know, starting to grow up, getting taller and all that, starting to fill out. Police, bug you. You know, who are you? Where are you going? You know, you know, walking while black. <laughs> You're not even driving by, you know, driving, driving while black. You're walking while black. And when I left the San Francisco Bay Area, the police attention just stopped literally literally it you know living in new york i didn't get that it just didn't happen to me it's like well okay you know you know pick a black man oh well which one are you gonna pick you know there are a million black people in brooklyn alone okay not that new york doesn't have its problems because it, it does but i didn't experience that kind of uh, that level of harassment interestingly coming to east cleveland Two weeks ago, for the very first time, I was actually, I wouldn't even say stopped. I was going to a convenience store. And I hear this, hey, hey, I'm just thinking it's one of the local guys. And all of a sudden, I felt this sort of light behind me, but I thought, you know, the guy's just steering into my direction. And the gentleman, police, came up to me, kind of flashed the light, and he had his laptop on. And uh, 
he asked me my name. So I told him, William Clarence Marshall, without hesitation. And he says, well, were you lo looking kind of like a guy? And he turned the laptop in my direction. And I'm thinking, that guy doesn't look anything like me. It's a cl very clear image. And then he went on his merry way. Because he saw me from the back, and I wasn't responding because at nighttime, somebody saying, hey, doesn't resonate with me. Matter of fact, the only way it resonates from, with me is to keep going. So there wasn't any problem. I was about to pull up my ID and say, would you like to see my ID? Now he said it wasn't necessary, and we just kept on going. But that was the first and last time that I've actually been stopped by law enforcement in East Cleveland. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And um, how do you see any evidence of how race or racism impacts the residents of the city? I see most of it in. I see most of it in the housing bubble. I see the I see the redlining. I see the uh, the the lending practices as it were. And of course, the, the MERS, the robo-signing, all of that, I see, I see destruction, literally, right in front of me, home after home. You can go online, you know, foreclose, bankruptcy, banks, um, and it's targeted areas. It's not everywhere. It's not everywhere you go in Cuyahoga County, but it's definitely here and neighborhoods like it. And, well, that's racism. It's bigotry. It's intolerance. It is, um, at our social justice forum, um, Jerry Goldberg from Moratorium Now came to our first social justice forum that the Carl Stokes Brigade uh, uh, hosted. He said, what we're experiencing, these foreclosures, is a form of terrorism. Terrorism. You know, of our, of, of our own citizens. In, in particular, African-American citizens, African-American homeowners. We're not just talking about first-time homeowners. You know, people who have been into owning a home are now experiencing what's happening here. You know, we're not just talking about having a job. I mean, people who have jobs can't keep up. Downturn in the economy, you know, downturn in hours, you know, uh, uh, monies that work, you know, were coming in. Other resources are being shut off. And, uh, you know, you can't get loans, you can't get credit, uh, or it's tightening up, or, you know, you owe this when you don't, when you can't prove, the bank can't prove that they actually own the note. That's a problem. That's more than problematic. That's racism at its, uh, it's a very new and fine form of racism, okay? And it is, again, racism, bigotry, it hurts. It hurts. It is, I would say, right now, what is happening to us, and not only to African Americans, but all Americans, is tantamount to treason. It is treasonous what our banks, the economic, this economic rapture, as it were, and it is happening in this city, literally, and not to be funny, in spades, um, it, is, it is not nice, it's not funny, it ought to be intolerable. It is, it's a rape. It's a rape of, uh, like any other. Uh, in this case, it's economic. They mean to have you out of here. Racism costs. It's costing everyone. And William, earlier you talked about a memory you had at East Cleveland when the um, East Clevelanders got together and they funded the trip for the, the uh, Shaw High School band mm -hmm. to go abroad. Now I'd like for you to recollect on a memory or instance where the community fought for something. Okay, fought. What was very impressive um, the passion, the, the heat, and the, the consistency was actually going to Huron Road and watching P 
people of all ages concerned about their hospital. And the Huron Hospital was their hospital. We're talking about people who were born here, people who worked there, people who had relatives, uh, who were proud that so-and-so went to college and ended up being a nurse, ended up being a doctor or a physical therapist working at Huron Road. You can look to that. People could look to that and say, yeah, that's my baby. That's my son. He's the doctor. He's the dentist. And now that hospital's gone. And yeah, there's a clinic. Clinic and a hospital aren't, they're not the same thing. And I saw people whipped up, passionate, and not, not, not just passionate. They weren't, they, they weren't, they weren't passionate in that they were, they were angry. There was anger and there was distrust, but they marshaled their facts. They came with knowing that it is not necessary to close this hospital. In fact, it is, closing it is dangerous to other communities. And that, that thought, that East Cleveland thought is backed up by EMS in other communities, fire and police saying, reiterating the same thing that the citizens here know. I know this, and for the record, I live here on Farmington Road, and I know that before that hospital was closed, that the traffic was coming from outside of East Cleveland to Huron Hospital from the west to the east. Now all I hear is everything coming from the east going to the west, okay? And if it was coming from the east to the west, it was going to Huron. You'd hear that siren and it would stop. Now all you hear is this long siren going, 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 starting way in the west, starting all the way down past Noble and keep coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. And those golden minutes are just ticking away and that person is losing precious time getting to the hospital. And I, it, it, it can't be, you can't paint it another way. A person's life is in the balance and that is not dramatic. I mean, any, anyone else who is, a, who is in the, who is in the life-saving business would tell you that there is a, there is a, a, a very small window to get this person in an ambulance and then to the hospital. I mean, we, notwithstanding age and your medical circumstance, even if you are in perfect health, the accident or the circumstance that has now happened to you puts your life in question and distance distance and time come into play in a big way and it's not fair it's not fair it's not right and on this fair play it's not american we should never ever have to wonder in this country why we are doing the things that we are doing when it comes to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness somebody's life is in the balance we should not care that it's in that community or this community we should be caring about the life and the resources brought to bear to make sure that that life is a well enjoyed life no one should have to worry that my god the hospital is so far away and how am i going to get there can someone reach me in time? I mean, that's, that, that's frightening. I mean, for, forget about, for the moment, that you are African American and that there is a, uh, there is a, um, there is a racial construct. Now, my life is in the balance. Will someone be able to get to me in time? Or am I going to watch myself as I go down Euclid and keep going and going and going and 
everything will pass in front of me before I actually get to this hospital. That's terrifying. William, earlier during our conversation, you talked about how, you know, various institutions, the one you just talked about mm -hmm. here in Road Hospital, uh, how that impacted the citizens of East Cleveland. Can you uh, think of any other instances where the surrounding institutions and or cities impacted East Cleveland? Surrounding institutions. Um, well, water, uh, garbage, um, even, uh, even our roads, you know, uh, the talk of just the roads being paved. I mean, we've had a problem right out here, right out in front of my door. You know, you've got a sinkhole. Okay, it gets paved. A guy comes out here and you ask him, hey, look, you're coming out here to pave it knowing that the road is going to sink again and everything that he or she has just put in place, oh, it's flat now, but it's going to sink assuredly in the months, the months, months yet to come, especially winter. It's going to crack and it's going to congeal. You know, it's going to shrink and expand and shrink and expand. And before you know it, that hole is going to become bigger. So it's just a Band-Aid fix. It's a, it's a Band-Aid fix, and that's a lot of what is going on around here. There are Band-Aid fixes. You know, you say, well, I see a problem. What you're doing is you just want to cover it up, okay? And you want to just keep ignoring it. You don't really, really want to put the resources that you have. Again, people are acting as though it's their money. You know, we have levies. And we're just about to come up with a, a, yet, yet another one. Um, another institution that's very important to East Cleveland, transportation. Transportation of the RTA. It's right here in our city, right there at the Lewis Stokes Windermere Station. You know, more than one third of all the buses end up or begin in East Cleveland. Uh, that, that, that's amazing. Um, you know, I can jump on the Superior Station, one of the reasons why I picked living here. One of the additional reasons is I get on it and 40 minutes later, I'm at the airport. I don't have to take my car. I don't have to do the short-term or long-term parking. I just walk the two blocks, put my luggage on, and it takes me to the airport, and I'm up the escalator, and I'm on my way. Wonderful. You, 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 can't, you can't beat that. Now, I will say, I want to say something about the RTA. I take the bus. I take the health line. I really do not think that you should involve yourself in such a small problem of fare jumpers. You're talking about less than a quarter of 1% of the 11 million or so riders. I think that's, I think that's the new fact um, that, um, uh, that are dishonest and that you're putting all of this people power into you know, making sure that everyone's got a card so that you can make sure that you are delivering a service that says, we get down from East Cleveland down to Tower City in an expeditious manner. I get all of that. But the idea that you randomly come on and check people, well, you're not randomly coming on and checking people. You are, you are choosing people. You seek out people. And I've, I've done the experiment myself. I get dressed get dressed in suit and tie and a briefcase and no one bothers me. I decide let me dress down and maybe not even have a ticket today or maybe I will have a ticket and see what happens and more times than not I have seen them I have seen the RTA actually come up and ask me where's my ticket. Suit and tie next day nothing nothing not a word and and again that's um intolerance bigotry that all costs uh and it's the only line that uh, that this this little indignity we have to suffer this little indignity 
And when I say we, by and large, the we are African Americans. You get on that bus and it's the health line. It isn't any other line in the city that requires that you show a bus pass. You just get on. Of course, of course you have to pay to get on any other bus. You could literally get on that bus and you don't have to show your pass. And I just think it's, it's ridiculous. It's just a ridiculous notion. Uh, it, it, they need to do something else. Uh, and the next time there is a meeting, I'm going to voice what I think they, they, they could do to possibly alleviate that problem. Well, since you're talking about alleviating a problem that exists, what is your vision for a future East Cleveland? And I want you to tell me about the major issues that you feel needs to be addressed in order to better East Cleveland, the neighborhood you live in, the community, and or the city as a whole. Okay. The city, well, the leadership in the city needs to, all the partnerships need to be looked at and what partnerships are valuable to us and those that don't seem to be of much value, maybe we need to look at them, reevaluate, and possibly strengthen that relationship. Uh, we need to strengthen or uh, think about new relationships beyond university circle, basically beyond our university circle partners. Uh, I was talking about the League of Cities and uh, a coalition of 19,000 cities across the United States and I'm sure our council members and our mayor are aware of that. I've been myself three times and it's wonderful. This coalition of 19,000 cities actually goes to DC once a year in part to meet their uh, congressional legislators in that uh, February, March time. But to find cities that have the same problems or had, the, had that problem and seek them out and their solution to pretty much the same problems that we're having. But one of the problems that we're having is, is our housing. Not just the housing stock, but keeping people in that housing. We need to retard, we need, we need a moratorium. We need time for people to get their financial houses in order. Not just their financial houses, but the pressure. Okay. Um, their financial houses in order. We need a moratorium on foreclosures. We need that. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't just demand it, want it. We need it. It is required or this community and communities like it will turn into a ghost town and you will not be able to revive it. No one wants a ghost town. It's this simple. You see a large window and you see a restaurant if there isn't anybody in that restaurant no matter how wonderful it smells you're not going in because you believe well lights aren't on there's nobody here therefore it really must not be any good so same thing this could be one you see this wonderful housing stock but if you add mythologies and pathologies, truths and untruths to the equation, and you keep publicizing those, people will believe them. They have, no, they have no reason to come here. I mean, you can introduce people and say, look at the great housing stock, but if they don't see that it's populated, they don't see that it's inviting, and they believe, they believe the stories, they won't come here. There needs to be a moratorium. The banks, and other financial institutions need to take their, their feet, literally, off the throats and off the wallets of people. There needs to be a moratorium across the board. Um, this cannot, this crisis cannot be sustained. Uh, they literally, their debts need to be forgiven. I mean, we forgave theirs. We forgave uh, but they, these huge financial institutions, they cannot fail. 
they're these, uh, this capitalism, the captains of industry, they can't fail. We can't have them fail because, you know, everything will fall down. Well, it's our turn. Where's the give back? Because what I see is that we're just getting blowback, okay? And that's the thing that needs to stop, first and foremost, and then reassess where we are. Bring the moratorium to two or three years, okay? Or completely forgive them. Give them the, the, the what is that, the concept of a, the quiet deed. It's forgiven, they pay their taxes on their properties, and let's go. Because when there is money in circulation and people have money, people can spend money. People can uh, re-energize and re-fortify their neighborhoods. And without it, what are you asking? What, what makes you think that someone from the suburbs or from another region is going to move here when they have a perfectly good system in place, a perfectly good neighborhood, perfectly um, a, a, a great tax base, and great institutions, you're begging the question, why would they get up? A, 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 a great tax base, institutions, why, what would make you think they would leave their colony to recolonize somewhere else that on the face of it seems barren? They think it's crime ridden. There isn't a hospital, okay, right next door. Why? You know, because, because you've got uh, great artistic and, and musical institutions and academic institutions, I can drive there, okay? And then I can say goodbye. But if it's not fortified, in meaning a moratorium on foreclosures, we can't get our house together. And we need that. This place we call East Cleveland, that we all call, we call home, needs that first, first and foremost then we can, make, we can make some other moves. We need to reassess our partnerships. Um, uh, we don't even have to think out of the box, but we need to retool, our leaders need to retool their egos. And if they don't, they need to, be, they need to literally be voted out of office. We've got great housing stock. We've got some great partners. We need a moratorium on foreclosures. And I believe with the moratorium, we can go forward because there is more money in the pockets of citizens. William, in closing, what would you be prepared to do to participate in making East Cleveland even better? Even better. Mm, even better. Well, even better. I think I probably want to talk to the folks at the library and at the theater, meaning the library in the theater. And I think th the library system here in East Cleveland needs, uh, if you want to call it an executive director uh, or an artistic director, um, I'm the kind of person, I'm the kind of person that would do that kind of thing. I'm not saying, hey, you got to hire me, but it's something that I would certainly love to do because I certainly have a, an expertise at it. You know, I, I've got a, I, I'm going to toot my own horn. I mean, let's see. I was on Broadway for four years in the Broadway National Tour of Showboat. I've done all kinds of international tours of all kinds of shows. I was on PBS. Uh, I've sung at Carnegie Hall twice. Uh, I did my stint at the Metropolitan Opera for two years. I bring a wealth of artistic experience uh, to the fore. Um, whether it's voiceovers, whether it's on the operatic stage, whether, it's in the, whether it is on the operatic stage or the concert hall, voiceovers, you name it. Um, I think that myself and other individuals who are in this immediate area have looked at East Cleveland and said, um, not enough is being done at the library or the library's treasure, which is the, uh, the theater itself. It's a gem that 
we could bring um, more value to East Cleveland through the arts. And for those that are listening, that's something that I want to do and I will be talking to those individuals. William, thank you so very much You're welcome. for this wonderful interview. Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, it's, it's just been a pleasure. I've learned a lot, uh-huh. and I'm sure a lot of the people listening to it will be able to gain a lot from it. All right. So. Thank you. You're welcome.